Uh, hi, I'm Peter Klapes, uh, and I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Kate Burrows, uh, a, current a current Voss postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Environment and Society at Brown University. Uh, Kate received her PhD from the Yale School of the, for the Environment and her MPH at the Columbia University School of Public Health. Uh, today, as part of the guest book's Hosting Earth series, uh, we'll be hearing a bit about Kate's work at the intersection of ecology and health. Uh, the Hosting Earth series is a year-long series sponsored and hosted by the Guestbook Project, uh, which looks to think about how philosophy, psychology, art, literature, science, and, and theology uh, can be used as effective means of responding to our current uh, ecological crisis. Uh, so Kate, uh, the Hosting Earth series is grounded in the belief that we are both hosts and guests of the Earth. Uh, we live in the Earth, um, but we're also welcomed to live in the Earth. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your work uh, and research, especially in light of this principle of uh, ecological reciprocity, as as Guestbook is is calling it, uh, you know, uh, this year and uh, and and beyond, hopefully. Sure. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really exciting to participate in such a multidisciplinary um, conference series. So I'm an environmental epidemiologist by training. And so that means that I study public health sciences and I'm broadly interested in the way that the environment influences human health. And so within that, my sort of subfield is focused on climate change and health. And that includes things like rising temperatures and air pollution and extreme disasters. So hurricanes, landslides, wildfires, a pretty broad range of environmental exposures. Um, and what I do in my work is I use both qualitative and quantitative methods to assess how the environment and also changes to the environment impact population health and well-being. So I think um, this is such an interesting question as it relates to hospitality. I think we often don't get to dig into this type of, um, I think, sort of theoretical underpinning in, in the field of epidemiology. Um, but as it relates to hospitality, I think that most of the work that I do and that my colleagues in the field do really is focused more on the inhospitability of environments um, to human habitation and also how that's becoming more of a problem due to climate change. So, for example, in some of my work, we've been able to quantify the um, increase in hospitalizations associated with tropical cyclones in the United States. And in a new project, we're looking at uh, extreme heat effects and how that impacts mental health. So we're seeing these sort of changes in the environment and how it's making it more difficult for people to live in places that previously maybe they didn't have these same issues or they did, but only in very, um, very rare occasions. So I think this work really identifies how many of these places on earth are becoming less, less and less hospitable to human life. And so, um, you know, another point that I think is important in my work and uh, something that we've seen throughout a lot of this research is related to the sort of vulnerability associated with hosting and being hosted. So for example, we've found that um, those who are more reliant on the land, like farmers, um, often are most at risk when faced with environmental disasters and climate change, because of course those disasters not only put them in direct danger, but they also threaten their sort of long-term well-being and economic stability. Um, so, you know, I think that this vulnerability has probably always been a bit of a part of the human condition and the experience of living on this earth, but where it's becoming a real problem, I think, is we're seeing as it relates to the context of climate change and these things becoming more and more frequent and really exacerbating this, this difficulty of habitability. So I think ultimately, to me, um, as we consider sort of the reciprocity of hosting, I see this in some ways as perhaps reflecting our failure to successfully or adequately uh, host the earth or act as guests that sort of merit this type of hospitality. Um, and it feels a little bit like we've perhaps failed in that regard. And of course, this means that a lot of this work tends to seem a bit pessimistic. Um, so maybe the last thing I'll say here is that some of my recent research has moved a bit more towards questions about if and how the environment can actually be beneficial and provide a place of refuge, especially for people who are displaced or migrating. Um, 
And, you know, we can talk more about migration later. That's a big part of my research, but, you know, we've done a little bit of research recently looking at residential greenness. So for example, the parks and trees around you and whether or not that can actually help to improve mental health among people who have survived disasters. So do we actually get this sort of healing benefit um, of being a part of the earth around us? And so, you know, I'm working on a project now to explore this theme a little bit more and specifically to identify whether or not environmental stewardship, so that is like literally caring for the earth, can actually help to foster a sense of belonging and place among these refugee populations. So, you know, of course, a lot of this work, I think, does draw on the negatives here, but I do think that um, there are a lot of ways in which we still have this sort of successful reciprocity relationship with the earth. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. It's so it's so fascinating. Um, though indeed, much of the work, I mean, as 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 we're hearing about it this year, is 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 unfortunately. I mean, we're we're in a crisis. We're indeed in a in an acute crisis. And I I think uh, you know, and I think uh, unfortunately, it, it 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 seems pessimistic. Though though, I am hopeful that you know we have we have we have ways of 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 kind of uh, you know kind of dealing with this. I mean, there's, there, there is, you know, interest out there. And, you know, as we're discovering with, with guest book, there are kind of a, a, a multitude of ways of going about this, um, you know, in a very interdisciplinary um, way. Indeed, for solving any problem, one has to first identify what exactly, you know, uh, is causing the problem. So I'm kind of curious, what, what would you argue kind of specifically? And, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we all know the the, the you know the the regularly cited you know kind of kind of ways of of, uh, of you know ecological you know damage you know um, uh, you know that that humans are you know kind of contributing to the world but um, you know but what what do you see as some of the specific you know things that have kind of co contributed to this increase in you know kind of ecological inhospitability inhospitability <laughs> um, uh, if you will, uh, you know, what, what exactly have we done? And then my next question will be, how, how can we solve it? And what, what can we stop doing or start doing? But, but firstly, what? Yeah, well, that, that one might be a trickier question, I think. But um, <laughs> I think, so the first thing that I would probably note here is that I think, you know, as I mentioned sort of briefly, like I do think it's important to recognize that a lot of these environmental exposures are, are happening not related to climate change. So there are major natural disasters that have occurred all across the globe in, in historical examples um, far before anthropogenic climate change became an issue. And so we have had to sort of grapple with some of these issues as a species, I think for a long time. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the sort of specifics here, I think another point to mention and something that a lot of my work focuses on is that the way that climate change and also the environment more broadly impact human health um, actually varies quite a bit depending on the type of exposure that we're talking about. So, you know, I, I mentioned a bunch of different environmental uh, events that I'm interested in, right? But the impact that those things have on health ha can vary quite a lot. So for example, um, in some of the work that we've done on hurricanes, we've seen an increase in respiratory disease hospitalizations after hurricane exposure. And that's sort of interesting because we would assume that you would see sort of injury and, and damage and those types of health impacts, but we're seeing these, um, these other more chronic disease impacts as well. And so that's kind of interesting. And what we hypothesize is happening potentially has to do with power outages. Uh, so hurricanes can lead to disruptions of power and people who are um, on ventilators, for example, may then need to go to the hospital because they don't have power. So that's an example, I think, of the sort of indirect pathways through which some of these environmental exposures may impact population health. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that per the next question that you're asking, I think that's really important in terms of identifying mm -hmm. solutions. But mm -hmm. so that's, that's sort of a bit just generally about the environmental exposures. I do think though that we can't, um, I certainly don't mean to undersell the uh, incredibly important role of, of humans in causing climate change and the degree to which the natural disasters that we're seeing are becoming more severe and more frequent. And so I think that we certainly, um, you know, I, I wouldn't wanna say that we were we were once in balance with the earth and now we've disrupted it, but we certainly have done a lot of disrupting. Um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with decisions that we've made around energy resources. Um, and I think that it's important to acknowledge the fact that while some of these exposures haven't been happening for a long time, they're certainly becoming worse and they're becoming more difficult for humans to cope with and respond to and then be able to prepare for the next one. I mean, what are some of the, um, 
you know, some of the some of the solutions. I mean, what's 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 one thing that we can do, you know, to to to, to deal with this? What's one concrete concrete way that we can, you know, kind of kind of deal with this? I mean, I'm you know, I'm I'm not a you know, I'm not in this in this field, and and uh, you know, but 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 I'd like to I'd like to you know contribute, you know, um, uh, you know, and I know that you know um, I know that a lot of people would <laughs> like to, um, you know. So what what what's one you know kind of concrete concrete thing that you hope that people will you know be able to do um yeah so i think um you know my work really focuses on adaptation so i think sometimes people uh, who work on climate change talk about two sort of discrete but important equally important strains so there's mitigation which is reducing the effects of climate change and the spread of greenhouse gases and then there's adaptation which is focusing on dealing with the adverse impacts of climate change. And my work falls more on the um, latter side, though of course the former is extremely important, but that's really not my area of expertise. And so I think that in terms of the adaptation though, what we can do is really identify, like I mentioned before, those specific causal pathways that are impacting population health, because that's the best way that we can intervene to help protect people's health in the long run, but in a way that is cost-effective and targeted and can actually protect some of the most vulnerable populations. So a lot of this work I think is perhaps more policy level than it is individual level. But an example would be, um, you know, if we're thinking about extreme heat, I'm working on a project now looking at heat and uh, specifically in homeless populations in Boston, because we think that these groups may be particularly at risk because they don't have access to cooling inside of a home, for example. And so working on this project can help us to identify um, perhaps where specific areas in the city that are at risk and that information can be used to help the government uh, the local government provide increased cooling centers, for example, which is something that they do during high heat days to help people cool off when they don't have access to air conditioning. So I think that this type of research that really targets specific populations and also um, incorporates some uh, geographical data as well and spatial data can be really helpful for creating targeted policies to respond to the specific impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what about um, you know what about the you're you're saying you know cooling centers and 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 air conditioning and and, and things like that um, you know but don't those I mean from from what I understand I mean do, doesn't you know doesn't AC have a bad you know environmental effect I mean I understand that you know certain chemicals and whatnot that can be used in AC um, you know or that are used in AC you know has a has a bad effect on the on the environment is that. Is, is that still the case? And, you know, how, how do we, you know, do we sort of balance, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult, you know, kind of, kind of quandary, but, you know, how do we balance, you know, A, the need for, you know, for, for indeed, you know, cooling centers and for, you know, health and, you know, taking care of, you know, each individual person, but also, you know, the fact that, you know, some of the ways of, 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 of living, some of the necessities of life, right, like AC contribute so negatively um, you know, to the, you know, to the earth and to our ecological habitat, um, and, uh, you know, and then lead to these issues. So we're kind of in this, in this cycle, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's a great point. And I think, um, you know, part of that is why, uh, simultaneously tackling the mitigation problem is extremely important, right? So we need to both be thinking about adaptation and responding to immediate threats to population health, which I do think are extremely important to deal with while at the same time working towards more sustainable energy sources. And you're definitely right that air conditioners have a huge trade-off here. They're certainly, um, less negative for the environment than they were in like the 80s, for example. Um, some of those chemicals have been regulated, but it does require power, it requires electricity and we're burning fossil fuels. And so I think um, some of this perhaps could relate to a community level response. So having a cooling center could perhaps be more efficient than having individual air conditioning units, um, though that is obviously a very complex policy question. And you're right that it does involve a bit of a trade-off of how do we protect the immediate needs of the health of the population today while not further digging ourselves into this hole that we're going to really struggle to get out of. Right, 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 right. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, 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 it, it's difficult work and, and, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're great to, to be, you know, thinking of, of, of solutions and, and thinking through it because these are, these are, you know, real, uh, you know, real problems. Um, tell us a bit, you had mentioned earlier about migration. Tell us a bit about, 
you know, migration and your and your work and research there. And you know, of course, we are the guest book project. So we would love we'd love, you know, stories from the field. I know that you've done work uh, really around the world uh, with various communities. Um, you know, so any any stories you have would be would be welcome. And, and just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, any 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 thoughts you might have on on, on the matter, of course, would be would be most welcome. Yeah. Yeah, so a big part of my work does focus on the impact of climate change and environmental disasters on migration and trying to understand specifically who is at risk of migrating or being affected and needing to migrate, and also then how that movement impacts health outcomes. And so um, my dissertation work focused on this topic in Indonesia, um, and I spent a lot of time in a community in central Java that was frequently affected by landslides. Um, and we did a mixed method project, which involved some qualitative work and also a quantitative survey to understand how people were experiencing landslides, because despite the fact that landslides occur all over the world and displace um, millions of people each year, there actually isn't a lot of research on landslide related displacement specifically. So we really wanted to try to understand how that impacts people's health and, and well being. And a couple of things that I think were really important that came out of that project. Um, the first was the issue that people were really struggling with repeated exposures. And so these individuals would experience really traumatic events. Landslides are, are I have fortunately never experienced one before, but have seen the destruction that they've caused in the community that I worked in. And, and it, it, is, it is really, really jarring. They are enormously destructive and they happen extremely quickly with, with relatively little warning. We don't have as good warning systems or predictions as we do for things like hurricanes and earthquakes. And that means that folks often don't have time to prepare and it can be really traumatic. And it is almost more traumatic that it's over so fast and, and so much of their lives change in this, this incredibly short period. But then people are really struggling. And as I mentioned before, one of the problems about climate change is that these disasters are becoming more frequent. And so folks would tell me stories of, of being able to finally rebuild their home and get situated again and restart their farming practice and then have another landslide happen. And that really, really impacts their ability to, to sustain any type of stability and, and routine and, and build for the future because they're always constantly dealing with what happened in the past and being afraid of what might happen in the future. And it really doesn't give them the chance to resettle into a, 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 um, a sense of place and, and a sense of self and purpose and, and move on from the landslide. Um, and then the other thing that I'll mention about that work that I think was really interesting is that we actually tend to think about climate migration as a sort of catastrophic disaster in which millions of people are going to be suddenly forced to migrate. And it becomes almost, um, I think often in the context of international security, we hear this, it becomes sort of a securitized problem, um, a securitization problem. And I think that what we've seen is that that really isn't the most likely situation. So we probably will see a, a, a substantial number, millions of people will be displaced by environmental events all across the globe, but it probably will happen over relatively short distances and not necessarily all at once. So I think understanding this sort of dynamics of climate migration are important so that we can more accurately convey these stories without um, without being alarmist. We have plenty of things to be alarmist about, um, but I think it's important to, to be accurate when we're talking about those things. And then the last thing that we found in this research in Indonesia that I thought was really interesting is that often climate change related migration is viewed as a last resort for populations because people want to stay where they are. And, and a lot of this has to do with their sense of home and connection to the land, especially if it's a community that has been there for many generations, it can be really difficult for folks to leave that behind and potentially never come back. But one thing that we did find in this research is that because people were experiencing so many disasters over and over again, that the folks who left actually did better in terms of mental health health and well-being than the people who stayed in place. And so I think that that's a really important story that doesn't often get told. And this is not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about people who are displaced by environmental events, but it is just to suggest that we also need to think about who's staying behind and are they staying behind because they wanted to stay behind or are they staying behind because they don't actually have the capacity, the capital, the flexibility to leave and go somewhere that makes them feel safer. Sure, sure, definitely. Um, I think, you know, being, being, being a guest, you know, sometimes can be, you know, can be, can be positive. I mean, I think that, you know, and, and perhaps you're seeing this in, in your, in your study, um, you know, but, uh, you know, sometimes change um, can be, you know, can be, can be positive for, for the individual, you know, um, 
you know. Um, now, where exactly, I mean, you know, I don't personally, you know, know any, you know, climate, would it be climate migrants? Is that, is that the, is that the correct term, you know? There's a lot of trouble around that word. There's been some concern. Some people say climate refugees, but that has a, a specific meaning under international law. And so it can be tough. Okay. I, tend, I tend to say climate migrants or, or people who moved because of environmental events. It becomes a bit wordy, but yeah, okay. I think you're safe with climate migrant. <laughs> climate migrants. Okay, very good. Um, um, so, you know, I don't personally know any climate climate migrants and, and I, you know, presume, um, you know, a good number of our, of our, you know, viewers and, and, you know, guest book, guest book project, you know, partners and, and uh, collaborators and whatnot, you know, don't necessarily, you know, a lot of us are, are, are from, from the United States. I mean, we're an international pro project, but a lot of us are, we're, we're based here in, in, in Boston, as you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of us don't know, you know, a climate, climate migrants. So where, where is it happening? Why is it happening where it's happening? Where are people going? Where are people coming from? Um, you know, and, and will there be a point, you know, a point at which, you know, we will know, you know, climate, climate, climate migrants, if you will, or, you know, when we will be, you know, I was kind of, you know, called to, called to be hosts, you know, of people or, or, or guests elsewhere, perhaps even, um, you know, uh, you know, as a result of climate activity, if you will, or, or, or for ecological reasons. Um, yeah, so so I think that there there will certainly be a point at which we we all know people who've been affected by some of these disasters, and I think that um, you know, in terms of where climate migration is already happening, we're certainly thinking about coastal areas where people are displaced by repeated hurricanes and um, increased flooding that's associated with sea level rise, um, and also areas that are affected by droughts and wildfires. California is a great example. In the last couple of years, there have been a lot of people who've had to leave their home because of the sheer destruction and, and who don't feel comfortable rebuilding in those places because a lot of predictions suggest that they, they may burn again sometime soon. Um, but that, so that's in the United States and, and also in other places across the world. But we are also really unfortunately seeing um, a lot of increased risk in some of the non-industrialized and newly industrialized countries, specifically small island nations. And that's a particularly challenging case of uh, environmental displacement because of the fact that those people, um, their entire homes are at risk, right? So. Mm -hmm. In, in the United States, for example, moving inland, perhaps you can move somewhere that's not too far. And that is what we see usually associated with, with displacement after disasters. So after Katrina, folks moved to nearby cities like Houston and they did migrate all over the country, but a lot of them stayed relatively close to the city. But when you're talking about a small island nation, there really isn't, there. there is not that much, you don't really have that many options. And so I think those questions are, are really important for us to think through in terms of how we can best support those people in terms of finding new places for them to go and how to support that migration. And a lot of different countries um, in the South Pacific are already really starting to address those questions and try to think through how they can best support those populations through this relocation. Um, and I think that, you know, per the, the conversation about being hosted, climate migration does also pose a really challenging question about in some cases requiring people to be hosted by other people. So we deal with issues about where people who are displaced can actually go. And the problem is that a lot of the time the places that they, they are able to get to are places where people are already living. And that poses some really challenging issues about how to facilitate um, environments in which the, the, the mover, but also the host population feels like they aren't sort of getting um, getting the short end of the stick or losing their sense of identity or the things that are important to them. And that's a really challenging issue that I think that we don't really have a lot of great solutions for yet, but it's something that we're just going to have to figure out in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. And and what what organizations are involved with, with this? If are there any global organizations involved in this? I, I, I mean, I presume maybe the, you know, the UN and whatnot would be involved, but what, uh, you know, what organizations do you know of that are yeah, so so the UN certainly has been thinking about this issue for a long time. Um, the UNHCR, which is their commission for uh, refugees, has been concerned about this, as well as UNEP, which is the environmental organization. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, IOM, which is the Intergovernmental Organization for Migration, is also thinking about and trying to prepare for and facilitate climate migration. There are also other, those, those being international bodies really do focus on this international migration. And that, like with 
um, small island states is going to be really inevitable in some cases. But as I mentioned before, a lot of the migration takes place over short distances. Um, and so there are also organizations like the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, a lot of acronyms in there. Um, and so IDMC does a lot of work on people who are displaced by disasters, but with, remain within their country borders. And, and a lot of those same issues still apply, even if you're only moving 20 miles down the road, 50 miles down the road, sometimes you still have to deal with assimilating to being in a different community or, or interacting with other people in a different community. So, um, you know, while the difference certainly does, uh, the distance certainly does make a difference, I think a lot of those issues are sort of paralleled despite uh, in different contexts. Sure, sure. got it, got it. Um, this is this is maybe a bit dark. I, I am coming from philosophy with uh, with 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 interest in uh, in, in you know existentialism and whatnot. But are we going to run out of places you know to to go to? I mean, what what uh, you know what's going to happen? I mean, it's 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 you know it's very alarming. You know, I I, I feel it now just talking to you. You know, it, you know, just kind of that 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 we are kind of you know in crisis mode, and and we should indeed be in crisis mode. It seems, um, you know. What, what's going to happen? I mean, are we going to, you know, are we going to, are there any safe havens? Have you, have you not seen, is there any place in the world that, that, you know, um, that you're not seeing this? I mean, I'd, I'd be curious about that. And also, I mean, indeed, what, what, what is the long-term, long-term idea? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think you're right to be concerned. I think it is, I think it is really alarming. And I do think that we need to take it more seriously in order to better prepare for the effects. And so, to, you know, the first question, I, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And I think that a lot of that, um, part of that is that I think that we still have time to intervene in some ways that can be really effective. And so this is not about mitigation. Again, again that's extremely important, but not totally the side of work that I'm an expert in. But I think that we can we know that people are going to be going to be displaced and more of them are going to be displaced and we have some sense of where some of them are going to go and so i think that if we start taking this seriously we can hopefully try to develop first a body of research but then also policy that can support people in their relocation so this would be things like identifying what types of community features help people do better in the long run and what types of places do people um uh, have more success in integrating in and how can we help communities that don't want to co-locate with another community find somewhere else to go and how can we facilitate these relocations for communities that are really struggling to afford to relocate in advance. Um, and so I think that that what's really important there is identifying areas that are at high risk and trying to plan in advance rather than waiting until people don't have any other choice because that's when you start to that's when it starts to feel a little bit catastrophic to me in terms of the ability for people and communities and the government and the entire globe to respond is if we're, we're really trying to scramble to catch up. And I think that we have not a big edge, but like a little bit of an edge and we can try to get a bit ahead of, of helping these communities make these really difficult decisions before they're kind of out of options. Right, right. Well, I was going to ask here, you know, at the end, uh, you know, for a, for a message of hope, um, but it seems that it seems that you know, indeed, you know, the fact that we've 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 got somewhat of an edge, as as, as you say, it might might be a message of you know a, a message of hope. Um, you know, any any further further thoughts or parting thoughts or, or um, you know or indeed you know further further messages of of hope or calls to action, uh, even yeah. Well, I think I think that is sort of maybe where I'd want to leave this conversation, which is that things are are not looking fantastic. And there are a lot of people who are already having to really deal with these these awful decisions about whether to leave the places that they love or to move somewhere where they feel safer and they feel like their children will be safer. And what an awful position to be put in. Um, no matter what it is that you choose. And I do think that the best that we can do for those people is to take that risk really seriously. And like I said, try to be proactive in dealing with it so that we can help make that decision. We're not gonna make it painless, but maybe we can help make it a little bit, a little bit less painful or at least help them to, um, uh, you know, Kir Kiribati, uh, the, a country in, in the South Pacific has talked a little bit about the policy of migration with dignity. And I think that, that is sort of the best that we can do, at least on this side of the problem. And, and simultaneously, again, I, I feel 
extremely, I feel it's extremely important that we continue to call for climate action and change on the mitigation side, because I don't think we need to, uh, you know, we can't stop everybody from having to migrate, but we can probably at least slow some of that damage and um, perhaps prevent the worst. Definitely. Well, it's very good to end on a, on a hopeful, on a hopeful, uh, or at least uh, somewhat hopeful, <laughs> somewhat, somewhat hopeful note. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, in a sense that sense that we can, uh, we can, we can, you know, do something at the very least that we've got, we've got some power here. Um, well, thank you very much, Kate, for, for sitting with, uh, sitting with me today and for, uh, for, for this very interesting, um, you know, conversation. Um, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me and best of luck with the rest of the series.